Okay, our last speaker is Sam Graham Felsen. Sam was a key member of President Obama's 2008 online campaign team. As chief blogger and narrator in chief, his goal was to recognize ordinary people and help them organize through the power of social media. Today, he's going to talk about the millennial generation and why they're such an important group to target. Sam. Hi, everybody. Um, I actually came in uh, from Ulesund, Norway last night. I bet there are some people who have been there or even from there. Um, big omega-3 uh, location. Um, so I'm uh, a little bit jet lagged, but I'm going to try to have as much energy as possible. Um, uh, I'm here to talk about the millennial generation. Uh, before I went to work for Obama, I was a reporter for a magazine called The Nation. Um, and I wrote about millennial politics. And I wrote about millennial culture. And um, I noticed that millennials were getting really excited about this guy named Barack Obama on Facebook. And uh, a college student. Uh, created a Facebook group urging Obama to run for president. Uh, and uh, the group quickly grew to about a half a million people. It was the fastest growing group in Facebook history. This was way back in 2006, which seems like a long time ago when Facebook was still a somewhat new thing on the horizon. Uh, it, was, it was, I would argue, as a result of that Facebook group that Obama was sort of nudged into actually running for president in the first place. Um, and, uh, and, and he actually had one of his very first rallies uh, that was almost exclusively organized by millennials who had started that Facebook group. Uh, so it's, it, they were absolutely critical to his uh, success, to him winning the presidency. So I'm going to start off um, just by showing a quick video from uh, the Obama campaign that I helped produce uh, that really spoke to this millennial generation, and I'll get into why uh, after I show that video. This election isn't going to be about changing parties. It's going to be about living for every other American. That's what gives me hope. just for me. I want a nation for everybody. You can't walk away and not feel hope and not feel that glimmer of light again. I don't think I was ever this interested in, in uh, the voting process. It's the first time I've ever felt compelled to be part of a movement such as this. I'm going to get them back involved in this process. The grassroots level first, and then let it go. That's going to make me happy. We're organizing ourselves. The campaign helps us. They're there to help us, but we're organizing ourselves. that we have with one another, that is our strength. I think for a long time I had given up that, that we could work together to make change in this country. Well, I've been involved in politics, I've seen politicians, uh, but this is different. Ladies and gentlemen, this is no ordinary time, this is no ordinary election, and this may be our last chance to reclaim the America we love. We are one people. We are one nation. And together, we will begin the next great chapter in the American story with words that will ring from coast to coast, from sea to shining sea. Yes, we can. OK, so there's something really unusual about that video. Whose face do you not see the entire time? Barack Obama. 
Um, that's, that's a pretty strange thing for me to tell you that that video um, was you know, the, one of the chief um, you know, stories that we told and, and one of the principal videos that motivated uh, millennials, but it didn't even show Barack Obama's face. Um, what we tried to demonstrate day in and day out of the campaign was that it wasn't a campaign about one person. It was a movement of many people, particularly young people. Um, and that spoke, to, uh, that spoke to these young people, and I'll get into why. Uh, 2011 was a, 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 I would argue, the year of, of the millennial. Um, all around the world, people were rising up against their governments. Um, uh, in Egypt, uh, it started on a Facebook page. Uh, and it went from a Facebook page to literally millions of people uh, taking to the streets and eventually overthrowing Mubarak. Um, we, saw, we saw this happen not just in Egypt, but in other places, including Spain, Israel, and of course the Occupy Wall Street movement, which, uh, which, which again, originally was started by young people um, and in New York City and then spread all across the country. Um, you know, all of this stuff was originated by young people on social networks. Um, so I want to just get into, uh, one, before getting into some of the specifics about the generation, another big thing that happened in 2011, the year of the millennial, was that Steve Jobs passed away. Uh, and a lot of millennials mourned him publicly. They were, they were going to Apple stores and putting up uh, shrines in Apple stores. Why was he so important symbolically to the millennial generation? It's not just because he made cool gadgets. What he did was he took technology, he took computers, which used to be the realm of nerds and geeks and people who understood how to do programming and how to, you know, I remember when I had my first computer, I was still typing in DOS commands. Um, he dispensed with all of that. He made uh, this technology a technology of the 99%. He made it something that was accessible to anybody. Um, so what he did was he, he gave people a sense uh, of empowerment. He gave people these tools that were no longer complicated to use um, and that they could use them and go on to use them as megaphones, as organizing tools uh, to reach out to their friends, to build movements. Um, so um, some, of the, uh, some of the key elements of this millennial generation, I think a better uh, descriptor of this generation are the digital natives because I, I would argue that by far the most important factor of what makes us different from the boomers and Generation X is that we grew up around technology and, and we grew up online. Um, so some, some, some just data. Um, uh, the, this, is, <laughs> this is the, uh, that's, that's a baby tweeting the second uh, he's born. Um, so this is, this is the largest uh, generation since the boomers. Um, there's, there's arguments over what millennials are, but, you know, what the age cutoff is. Technically, I guess I'm on the oldest edge of the millennials. I was born in 1981. Uh, but but, but it's, it, it, is, it is a massive generation. Um, it's going to be 50% of the workforce by 2020. Um, one of, the, one of the, 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 the sort of key differences between my generation and Generation X is that we're less cynical than Generation X. Um, generation X is the sort of punk rock um, generation. Um, we, we are a generation that actually gets along with our parents, which is an unusual thing. Um, uh, uh, part of the reason why is because our parents... Um, uh, praised us constantly, um, and uh, there's uh, some sociologists have described us as trophy kids, um, because even when we lose, we get trophies. <laughs> Just for showing up at the soccer game, we get a, we get a trophy. Um, and uh, uh, but it, it, part of part of uh, you know the, the consequence of that, of course, is that millennials are. Some people think we're arrogant. Some people think that um, we don't wait our turn in line. Um, and in organizations, we tend to want to accelerate uh, quickly, um, and, and you know, uh, some people think that we're impatient. Um, uh, our parents have been described as helicopter parents because they are constantly hovering <laughs> above us. Um, so it's given us this sense that we can do anything, this, this sort of optimism. But again, as I said, I think the key defining element of this generation is, is that we're perpetually wired that all of us um, that, that we didn't have to learn how to use technology. I mean, we, we can pick up this free tablet and immediately understand how to use it. It would take my mom several weeks, sorry mom, it would take her several weeks to figure out how to use that thing. But we can figure it out because we, we, we we're born with it, we've been using it um, our whole lives and we're fluent in this stuff. Um, so some quick stats on social media and, and how quickly everything's grown. Um, there are about 900 million people on Facebook. It's, it, by itself, it would be the third largest country in the world behind India and China. Uh, 
250 million on Twitter. And by the way, it's amazing to me, because I, I, I was a student when Facebook started at my school. Um, I remember I was probably one of the first few hundred people that signed up. Um, you know, I remember us thinking, oh, Mark is up to some trouble again. Uh, and now he's Mark Zuckerberg, the zillionaire of the world. Um, LinkedIn has 160 million people in it. So these are, these are not things that um, you know, the kids are doing anymore. This is what everybody's doing. I'm sure everyone in this room is on at least one, if not all, of these social networks. Um, so, so, OK, what is it about, um, what, what, are, what, what is the sort of psychological or social impact of growing up around all this technology? Um, I would argue, again, it's the sense of empowerment. Um, think about Wikipedia. I mean, when I was a kid, uh, you know, I, and I was doing a research project, I went to the Encyclopedia Britannica or, uh, you know, some other kind of encyclopedia, um, and I thought, oh, you have to be a genius to, you know, write for, you know, write in the encyclopedia. You have to be an expert. You have to really, really know what you're talking about. Uh, you have to have some special degree from Oxford or, you know, Harvard or whatever. Um, today, uh, literally a 12-year-old can edit a Wikipedia entry you know, in his basement while wearing pajamas. Uh, and by the way, Wikipedia studies have been done is about 98% as accurate as the Encyclopedia Britannica. So what does that do um, when a young person can, can you know, edit an Oxford professor's entry on Wikipedia? Um, you know, it gives people the sense uh, of empowerment. It gives them a sense that they don't need permission uh, or titles or prestige uh, to do things. They can just go do them because they have the technology to do it. They don't need middlemen to give them permission. Um, <clears throat> there, there's, there's, there's really uh, sort of a micro-celebrity culture in, in this generation. I mean, my, my parents um, grew up watching television, um, but, you know, if they yelled back at the television screen, it doesn't, you know, nothing's going to happen. Um, I grew up with the internet. Um, when I didn't like something, I could talk back to it um, and make a difference. Um, I could, you know, in a sense, have my own following. Um, everyone on Facebook is, in a sense, their own sort of celebrity because they've got hundreds of people who are paying attention to what they're saying every second. And, you know, in the, think about it. I mean, before Facebook, um, the largest audience most people ever had was at Thanksgiving dinner, you know, with their families. Now, every day, they're speaking to hundreds, if not thousands, of people. Um, four million tweets are produced per hour. Seven billion pieces of content are uploaded a week on Facebook. One out of five millennials have even posted a video of themselves online. Um, a quote from a YouTube official, YouTube greenlights everything. Um, think about it. If you wanted to um, you know, be a, a celebrity or if you wanted to be a comedian or if you wanted to you know, make a movie, in the past you would have to go get an agent, you would have to go to Hollywood, you'd have to talk to tons of different you know, directors and, and, and you know, get a middleman to say, okay, we'll give you the green light. Now anybody who wants gets the green light immediately on YouTube. Um, Justin Bieber, the, you know, arguably the biggest you know, pop star of the millennial generation, started out on YouTube. He was just uploading videos himself on YouTube. Today, all of the top comedians start out by putting their clips on YouTube and going from there. Um, there's also this, this culture of sharing. Um, it's not just speaking and speaking your mind uh, and telling everyone about yourself. It's about telling people about your preferences. 82% um, of millennials have joined a, a brand-sponsored Facebook group or Twitter account, uh, and nearly half have joined more than three. 60% of millennials go out of their way to actually rate products and services online. They want to tell everybody about what's good. It's, you know, it's, you know, they, they, they feel cool when they, you know, recommend something that's good. 47% um, write about their good experiences online, and 40% 40, 40 have also criticized a brand on a social network. Um, so this is a generation that's empowered, but of course it's also a generation that is coming out of college or coming of age in this horrible economic climate. Uh, and it's been particularly hard on millennials. 13% unemployment in the United States among millennials. 94% um, of college graduates are graduating with debt. So this is a generation that you know, might be freaking out about their pocketbooks more than other generations. 25% are moving back in with their parents after living on their own. 20% um, have postponed getting married or having kids. Um, and what impact is this having on consumer choices? Well, 60% are now saying that they actually choose a cheaper brand over their preferred brand. And they also go online to do research before just, just buying a brand. In the past, there might have been a more casual consumer decision. Now they're actually saying, well, I, I'm going to go do research. I'm going to find you know, a website that gives me a better price on this product. Um, 
the, the interesting thing, though, about millennials, again, we have this deeply sort of ingrained optimism as a, as a generational culture. 90% uh, of millennials, even in this horrible economic climate, say that they earn enough now, or at least they expect to earn enough in the near future. Um, so this is not a, a doom and gloom generation at all. Um, and uh, a key to the economic recovery a lot of economists talk about is that millennials are still willing to spend money, um, especially when it comes to new technologies uh, or anything that's on the cutting edge, because being on the cutting edge is a part of what's cool uh, to millennials. Um, and I, I would argue you could apply that to, to, to you know, uh, stuff that's not, not just talking about iPhones, but about health uh, and, and, you know, uh, so... Um, Part of this optimism also comes from, it, it goes along with a sense of social responsibility. This is a very socially conscious generation. Um, it's, 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 of course, a generation that uh, overwhelmingly helped to elect Obama. 66% of my generation uh, voted for Obama. So why is this generation so socially conscious? Uh, part of it is because it's such a diverse generation. Um, you know, when, when, when my parents were kids in the United States, they, they went to school with all white people. I mean, today, 40% of Generation Y are people of color, and of those, 50% are Hispanic. Uh, there's widespread support for things like civil rights and gender equality. And as a result, uh, it's a generation that's much more likely to support products based on the social values of the companies. So I would argue sustainability, even if it's maybe not as big of a concern for the wider population, for millennials, it's going to be a big concern. So it's something you guys have to think about. Um, I'm going to show you some quotes from companies that are now among the biggest companies in the world. Um, I want to put a ding in the universe. Don't be evil. 140 characters can change the wor world. All right, the first quote is from Steve Jobs. Um, you know, Apple, most profitable company in the world. The quote is not, I want to make as much money as possible. It's, I want to put a ding in the universe. Um, Don't be evil is Google. And of course, 140 characters can change the world is from the CEO of Twitter. Um, these are the kind of values that um, millennials have. They're, they're excited by messages that incorporate social consciousness. Um, so just to wrap up, uh, uh, I have a few more minutes. Um, this is a profoundly oversaturated culture. Um, and we see about 3,000 marketing messages a day. Um, uh, as a result, they said, we're, 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 we're sort of tuning out the, the normal kind of marketing messages and going out and doing research on our own. 87% um, are going to multiple sources before buying a product. They're doing the research. But the most important factor is that they actually, um, you know, they're not going to necessarily t trust a television ad or a print ad or a radio ad. They're going to trust what their friends are telling them on social networks. Um, so I'm just going to close with, with a few examples of how we're able to so successfully market to and reach young people during the campaign uh, and tap into some of these generational trends that I've been talking about. Um, number one, we showed a profound respect for uh, our supporters, particularly our young supporters. Um, we gave them exclusive privileges to show that uh, you know, we really meant it when we said this campaign is about you, it's not just about Barack Obama. For example, when Obama was announcing who his vice presidential pick was going to be, the traditional way of announcing this is you go to the most important journalist in the country and you leak the information to them. Um, we actually did something the opposite. We said anybody who signs up for our SMS program or gives us their email address, we will email you or text you the second he makes his decision. Um, so we are going to give you this exclusive information that everybody wants first to demonstrate our respect for you. Um, the second uh, big factor is that we listened to them. We really, we really listened. Um, it wasn't a one-way, old-style communication program where we just said, this is our message, take it or leave it. We were constantly saying, here's Obama's health care plan, um, but we want to hear your ideas. You know, we want to hear your stories. And if, if they're good and if they're interesting, we might even incorporate them into Obama's program. Um, we also wanted to hear, we also wanted to demonstrate that we were listening when they weren't happy. Because, you know, your consumers or your followers sometimes get annoyed at you, um, you know, uh, and uh, I think a lot of businesses um, have been reluctant to embrace social media because, um, you know, they don't feel comfortable engaging with critics. They would rather ignore critics and press on. Uh, that's, the, that's the old way of doing communication strategy. 
Um, but we, um, we had the opposite approach. We said, you know, we have to listen to people even when they disagree with us. So one big example when this happened was Obama changed his mind on this um, pretty critical uh, bill that would have allowed the government to, some people said, spy on citizens by looking into their phone records. Obama argued that it was a, a national security measure. His critics said that it was spying. Um, 20,000 people joined a group on mybarackobama.com. That was another thing that people said we were crazy for doing. We allowed anybody who wanted to to create a blog or a group on Obama's website. 20,000 people created a group saying, we want Obama to give us back the donations that we gave because we're so angry that he changed his mind on this policy decision. Um, it, you know, unless he changes his mind again, unless he re-reverses course, we want our donation money back. And 20,000 people signed up uh, for this group. Now, that's not 20,000 people in the corner you know, or down the street. That's literally 20,000 people in your home, basically banging on the front door, telling you uh, that they want their money back. So we had to figure out, what, what do we do about this? Um, I had access to a big red delete button <laughs> that was tempting to, uh, to, to click. Um, I didn't click it because I knew that um, the worst thing you can do is try to delete something on the internet. Um, it just creates this, this horrible uh, ripple effect where um, you know, thousands more people are going to join the group, and it could have grown bigger and bigger and bigger. So um, what we did is we went to Obama, we talked to him, and we told him what happened, and he wrote a really long, thoughtful response to these people, and we posted it on the blog. And he told them, I'm not going to change my mind. I'm staying put with my decision, but I respect you, and I want to tell you one other thing. It's young people like you who are savvy and using technology to organize to get my attention, to get 20,000 people to come uh, you know, into a group on my own website protesting me that are the key to this campaign. Um, I need you guys. You guys are arguably you know, some of my most valuable supporters because of how uh, empowered you are and how good of organizers you are. Um, and so I'm not changing my mind, but I really hope I can continue to have your support. And what was amazing about this is that even though he didn't cave uh, to their demands, um, he showed that he was listening. And almost everybody said that we could keep the donations, and many of them actually doubled their donations because they were so impressed that a politician actually listened. Um, so, and the last thing I'll say about our strategy of, 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 of engaging millennials, the, the way that we were able to uh, get two-thirds of the vote, the way we were able to beat Hillary Clinton and then go on and win this historic presidency is because we actually trusted them to do this peer-to-peer -peer marketing themselves. We didn't feel a need to train them uh, with paid staffers. We created MyBarackObama.com. We gave them these digital tools where they could make phone calls to undecided voters, where they could connect with people in their own communities, uh, where they, we, we gave them maps where they could go knock on doors and collect data on who was supporting Obama and who wasn't uh, so that we could try to persuade those undecided voters. Um, it was because we trusted these people who had no experience, who had you know, no, not necessarily like a, you know, a fancy diploma, who weren't trained um, by any paid staffer, and we gave them the tools to go out and organize on their own. That's how we were able to win uh, the election. We knew that this was a, a profoundly empowered generation that if left to their own devices, we could trust them to go out and advocate on our behalf. We didn't have to obsessively control them and tell them what to do. And that, that, that's a huge, huge part of, I think, the shift in marketing is will companies um, loosen up a little bit, realize that they don't have to control messages all the time, and realize that um, if, if they empower their most passionate supporters and advocates um, to go out and spread the word themselves, uh, it can make a giant impact uh, on their industry. So um, I, the last thing I want to say is just, you know, if it, social media is clearly the way to uh, reach this generation. Uh, I'm not saying television isn't important for marketing. It still is. But in a few years, every new TV is going to be connected to the internet. So we're going to see this hybridization where TV and the internet, there's no difference. Uh, everything's going to be on demand relatively soon. Uh, but this is a generation that uh, can be reached by social media. It's a generation that is uh, culturally ingrained to respond to social media and peer-to-peer -peer recommendations rather than old-style marketing. Uh, and social media has to be social. You can't take the old style of one-way communication uh, and just plant it on Facebook and hope it's going to work. You can't take a TV commercial and just throw it on YouTube. You've got to do something that feels YouTube-y, <laughs> uh, that feels more authentic, that feels more conversational uh, and human. Um, and, uh, and basically, at the end of the day, uh, you know, 
I, I understand that a lot of businesses um, who are used to doing marketing in a certain way feel hesitant and tentative about embracing social media because of all the risks involved uh, with losing some control of your message. But clearly, the benefits, I believe, outweigh the costs, especially in a field like yours. You can think of yourselves as an underdog field because so few people in my generation uh, have embraced it so far. Obama was an underdog candidate. If he hadn't embraced social media, he never would have been, become the president of the United States. Um, it was because he took the risk and embraced this new uh, empowering uh, uh, technology uh, that empowered this young generation that he was able to sweep his way into office. So thanks very much.